with new temperature records being set, climate change is at the forefront of African Development Bank strategies. Despite being forced to change funding priorities in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the bank has committed itself to mainstream climate change and green growth into operations and policy design by devoting 40% of project approvals to climate finance. In 2020, 88% of all projects were based on climate-informed design. Working hand-in-hand -hand with the Global Center on Adaptation to launch the African Adaptation Acceleration Program in 2021, the African Development Bank has set a goal to double its climate financing to $25 billion for adaptation by 2025. But adaptation alone is not enough. Mitigation also matters. In the Sahel region, the African Development Bank launched a $20 billion project, the Desert to Power, a huge solar initiative that will make Africa a renewable energy powerhouse producing electricity to over 250 million people. In Senegal, a project financed by the African Development Fund, the concessional window of the African Development Bank Group and the Global Environment Facility is not only restoring ecological balance to Lake Gaias, it is also improving access to abundant supplies of clean water. <laughs> Through its transformational projects, the African Development Bank is helping countries reduce climate risk and build resilience, another way in which we are making a difference. After day, the relentless sun shines down on the Sahel, one of the regions of the world that received the highest amount of sunlight. The Sahel countries, Burkina Faso, Chad, Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal and Sudan are among the most vulnerable in Africa. The Sahel is also highly affected by climate change and fragility, which undermines the region's food security, the country's long-term development prospects and opportunities for youth. We see um, impact of climate change particularly affecting this region. Um, we see an energy sector that is dominated still largely by fossil fuel generation, by a generation capacity that is grossly inadequate to the needs. Uh, in fact, the production of electricity in the G5 Sahel countries is roughly equivalent to that of Trinidad and Tobago. But the sun that defines the Sahel also has the power to reshape the region. That is the spark behind the Desert to Power initiative. The initiative will harness the solar energy generating 10 gigawatts of additional capacity to provide clean electricity for 250 million people and will help build the world's largest solar zone. Desert to Power is part of the African Development Bank's New Deal on Energy in Africa and a key pillar of the Great Green Wall initiative. Pour le leader global, c'est vraiment très fort toute cette initiative. Donc, il n'y a pas aucun doute qu'on va mobiliser toutes les ressources nécessaires pour ça. The bank views the Sahel region as a region of opportunities, opportunities based on green growth and post prosperity, underpinned by clean, reliable, and affordable energy. In 2019, the heads of state of the G5 Sahel countries, namely Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania and Niger, endorsed the implementation of the initial phase of the Desert to Power DTP initiative. L'heure est venue de, de conclure l'essai. Il nous faut passer des ambitions aux réalisations. Roadmaps in these countries have enabled the identification of 85 priority projects for preparation and investment based on five priority intervention areas which are solar generation, transmission and distribution, decentralized solutions, utility reform, enabling environment projects. 
all of these have capacity building as a cross-cutting priority. Nous savons tous que l'énergie est, est un puissant levier pour être, lutter contre la pauvreté, réduire toutes les formes d'inégalité, notamment les inégalités régionales, et accélérer la réalisation de notre objectif commun, le développement inclusif. The Desert to Power Initiative has an investment value of well over 20 billion US dollars. Realizing it will require mobilization of resources at scale and close collaboration with governments, development partners and the private sector. Africa Energy Marketplace gives us a unique opportunity to come together and begin our journey through desert to power with the force of our transformative ideas, goodwill and entrepreneurial energy. Desert to power investments aim to accelerate economic development through access to electricity, such as irrigation powered by electrical pumps to improve agricultural productivity and food security, better access to health and education and reduced time spent collecting firewood for cooking will help create new opportunities, particularly for women and youth. This will not only deliver economic, social and climate benefits, but will contribute significantly to peace, security, and stability to the region. Beyond lighting up the Sahel, the Desert to Power initiative will energize a host of new possibilities for Africa's people today and the years to come. Without energy, you cannot see, nor heal, nor live. Without energy, a country cannot develop, neither socially nor economically. Without energy, a country can lose up to 4% of its GDP. With an average GDP two and a half times lower than the rest of the continent, the countries of the Sahel are among the most vulnerable in Africa. And yet, you can find energy everywhere. You just need to see it, because the Sahel is one of the sunniest regions in the world. Let's exploit it. Desert to power. Let's turn Africa into a renewable energy powerhouse. the beautiful capital city of Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire, a very big welcome to the African Development Bank's 
2021 Kofi Annan Eminent Speakers Lecture Series. We are exceptionally delighted and honored to have with us today the 2019 Economics Nobel Laureate, Professor Esther Duflo, who will be introduced shortly. I'm Victor Oladukon, and it's my pleasure to moderate this second virtual forum in the Eminent Speaker Series. Following the Eminent Speaker's keynote, there will be a virtual conversation and Q&A with Professor Duflo and African Development Bank President Dr. Akimumi Adeshina, which you really don't want to miss. As the saying goes, brevity is the spice of life. So on that note, I'll go over to Professor Kevin Chika Urama, the Acting Chief Economist and Vice President for Economic Governance and Knowledge Management at the African Development Bank for short opening remarks. Professor Urama. Mr. President, Professor Duflo, Professor of Economics at MIT and uh, 2019 Nobel Laureate in Economics. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Ambassadors, Members of the African Development Bank Board of Directors, Senior Management, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to uh, make this opening remark at this 2021 Kofi Annan Eminent Speakers Lecture Series. The Eminent Speakers Lecture Series was launched in 2006 as a special forum for exchange of opinions and sharing insights and to shape development policies, programs, and projects in Africa. Two interactions with the eminent scholars, world-renowned personalities, and Nobel laureates, the lecture series enriched our policy dialogue on contemporary policy challenges in Africa to prefer concrete and implementable solutions tailored to the specific features and needs of the continent. Over, the, over 30 years, uh, the eminent, over 30 eminent persons have graced the, uh, several editions of the lecture series and addressed several topics of importance for African development and development policy in Africa. Today, we will have Professor Esther Duflo, Professor of Economics at MIT and the 2019 Nobel Laureate in Economics um, as the 2021 eminent speaker for this year. Her lecture is titled Good Economics for Warmer Times, How to Address Our Climate Challenge in Africa. Coming on the heels of the uh, COP26 in Glasgow and heralding the COP27, the African COP, uh, to be hosted by the Republic of Egypt, this team could not be better timed. The speaker will address several issues that will be of key interest to how Africa and the world can respond to the short, medium, and long-term challenges associated with climate change. It is my pleasure, therefore, to invite you, Dr. Akimwumi Adesina, the president of the African Development Bank Group, to welcome the 2021 Kofi Annan eminent speaker, Professor Esther Duflo, to the African Development Bank Group, and to cut the ribbons to open the Kofi Annan eminent speaker's lecture 2021 edition. Thank you. Would you? Our own distinguished speaker will be introducing our eminent speaker, Professor Dufle. The singular ladies and gentlemen. The Kofi Annan Eminent Speaker Series is dedicated to essentially Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan was a great mentor of mine for many of us. He was somebody that was UN Secretary General. He was at the forefront of development thinking on issues that matter to all of our lives, on issues of poverty, on issues of inequality, on issues of global poverty, and of course, on the issues of climate 
as he walked a lot of those throughout the rest of his life. And he was a great friend of the African Development Bank. You all knew him. The Millennium Development Goals then transitioned into the Sustainable Development Goals. But it's very clear as we transition that and we continue to make the progress on the Sustainable Development Goals, that are achieving them have come under increasing pressure. Pressure from the COVID-19 pandemic. Pressures arising from the debt challenge that we have seen, which is actually linked to the COVID-19 derived pandemic itself that created fiscal challenges. But of course, also because of the climate crisis, which is what our distinguished speaker will be speaking about today. The climate crisis clearly is getting worse as has been very well made clear by the IPCC report. The globe is warming. We're losing quite a lot in terms of our glaciers. Sea temperature is rising. We're finding a lot of floods. We're finding a lot of drought. And we have quite a lot of desert locusts that are devastating crops all across many parts of Africa. Not only are we losing lives, we're also losing gains that we have made in our economies and we're losing massive amount of infrastructure. And just as a, an example, you see what has happened to us in um, Southern Africa when we had all of the uh, cyclones there, Idea, there in Mozambique, in Malawi, and all of those. You see what is happening in uh, the Sahel region where we have increased desertification and land, and land degradation. Um, we also have situations that we are seeing in other parts of Africa, like in the Lake Chad Basin of Nigeria, bordering also um, uh, uh, Cameroon and all the other places. Now, what that has shown us is that livelihoods are being dramatically affected. As I was mentioning, the case for the Lake Chad Basin is one where you have a, a lake that had 25,000 kilometers squared that has shrunk today to 2,500 kilometers, and without when the livelihoods of millions of people, massive displacement, refugees, livelihoods dried up, economics dried up, and of course, all that meant now is that we have a lot more people that are unemployed, young people, and it has been at the heart of the conflicts, let me say even terror attacks and growth that we have seen in that part uh, of the world. So there are critical issues that we must reflect on on the economics of warming, which our speaker will speak about. How do we reduce global emissions? How will developed countries support and how should they support developing countries? We know that where there are externalities, generally in economics, you wanna make sure that the polluter pays principle applies. But in this particular case, those that are causing global externalities for us, in the global commons happen to have so much power. So you have asymmetry of power by the greatest polluters. You also have the polluters controlling most of the resources. And you also have a situation where polluters decide yes, on their own willingness to pay. Not hearing. To being able to actually internalize the externalities that they actually create. So we have an estimate of issues that I believe that, you know, the good economics should help us to address some of these kind of issues. I feel that it's time for us to also ask ourselves the question, how to ensure global commitments to climate change are met and how to build trust on the pathway to being able to address those things. And how do we finance global climate change, both mitigation and adaptation? And how do we make sure that in all that we do, the low-income countries and the small island states that seem to be very poor are not marginalized in for what they did not actually cause. And how do we so support also sustainable energy transitions and make sure that that is done in a way that is sustainable, but in a way that also makes sure that we do not reduce or marginalize developing countries that actually did not cause the problem that we are talking about today. We could not have asked for a better speaker 
the better person to speak to us today. I was just speaking with Professor Duflo just moments ago. Well, let me say that she is one of the people we are extremely proud about of globally. Not only is she smart, not only is she uh, uh, one of the youngest professors that are actually in the still even win a Nobel Prize, but she's very practical. She is very pragmatic. And our work actually comes not from theory, but theory that is informed by grand knowledge and people's lives. And that makes her very, very different. Let me tell you a few things about our speaker today. Professor Esther Duflo is the Abdul Latif Jamel Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics in the Department of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She has been a co-founder and co-director of the Abud Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. In her research, she seeks to understand the economic life of the poor with the aim to help design and evaluate social policies. She has worked on health, on education, financial inclusion, environment, and governance. Professor Esther Duflo's first degrees were in history and economics from Ecole Normale Supérieure Paris. She subsequently received a PhD in economics from MIT in 1999. And before we came live, I was asking her, why did she make the transition from, from history to economics? And she really wanted to uh, learn more about what affects people's lives. And she felt that history wasn't going to help her to do that. And so she moved into economics. And thank God that you did, Professor. Professor Duflo has received numerous academic honors and prizes, including 2019 Verges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel, which is a Nobel Prize winner in economics with co laureates Abhijit Banerjee, who is, happens to be her husband. So when you have a husband and the wife, or the wife and their husband being Nobel Prize winners, now that tells you that's a power couple you have right there. They got that together with Michael Kramer. She has won the Princess of Asturias Award for Social Sciences in 2015. She's won the ASK Social Science Award again in 2015. She has won the Infosys Prize in 2014, the David Kasher Award 2011, a John Bates Clark Medal in 2010, MacArthur Genius, Genius Grant Fellowship in 2009, with Abhijit Banerjee, she wrote Poor Economics, A Radical Thinking of the Way to Fight Global Poverty, which won the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award in 2011, and has been translated into more than 17 languages and the recently released Good Economics for her times. It's, she's an amazing scholar. She joined, I was looking at her on the, on, the, on the Wikipedia, and I wanted to say to you what I see about her career, and I'll read it from Wikipedia. After earning her PhD in 1999, Duflo became an assistant professor at MIT. She was promoted to associate professor with tenor in 2002, incredible, at the age of 29, making her among the youngest faculty members to be awarded tenor, and she became a full professor in 2003. I mean, that is incredible. Professor Duflo is the editor of the American Economic Review. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. And now we can add at least an honor for us to add you as an eminent distinguished speaker for the Kofi A. Annan Eminent Speaker Series of the African Development Bank. So we can claim a little bit of you, a little bit to ourselves. You will be speaking to us today on good economics for warmer times, how to address our climate ch change challenges. Without much ado, Professor Duflo, you are welcome. And I did tell you in the beginning, I will use a bit of my French. Thank you very much. Merci. Merci. Um, Monsieur le Président, uh, Désinaire, uh, uh, 
a member of the board, uh, honorable ministers, uh, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very uh, honored to be delivering this lecture uh, for any number of reasons, but in particular for its dedication to, uh, to Kofi Annan, who was, of course, uh, a wonderful president of the UN and, and someone who has durably influenced uh, the, the, the trajectory of development and uh, my trajectory as well because the, uh, for any for several reasons but in particular the fact that the millennium development goals uh, have really shaped the and given uh, a structure and a direction to the work in many developing countries which in turn I was able to uh, help support via my main um, activities, which is uh, through the uh, Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, the evaluation of uh, what policies are effective and what are not effective to achieve concrete policy goals. And it became much easier to have a dialogue on what these concrete policy goals are once the uh, Millennium Development Goals, which now have become the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, gave a framework and gave a name in some sense on the various things that country needed, countries needed to, um, to aim. In particular, I say that perhaps a bit selfishly, I think it has really helped uh, shifting a little bit of the focus away from being focused only about GDP and economic growth but being focused more generally about welfare, the welfare of the population, which of course include income and poverty, uh, but also include things such as infant mortality, maternal mortality, education, uh, and of course the climate, which is what I want to talk uh, about today. So I think this was a remarkable uh, uh, individual. It is a remarkable individual, and it was a remarkable at the UN, uh, more transfer, transformational than, than perhaps any in, in recent history. So thank you very much for, for having me uh, on this occasion, and I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be speaking uh, on, uh, with my name attached to it. Uh, what I'm going to do, if you allow me, is to share some string. Ah, I don't have the right to uh, share my screens. Um, if you give me rights, I will share my screen, otherwise I'll do it without slides. Victor, let's make sure we get Professor the right to share our screen. Yeah. You, do, you do have rights right now, Professor. Thank you so much. I'm on top of it. Yep. Great. So I have uh, entitled this call, uh, Good Economics for Warmer Times. Uh, it is a bit of a shameful attempt at self-promotion because in 2019, Abhijit Banerjee and I published a, a new book, or at the time was a new book called Good Economics for Hard Times. And uh, of course, we wrote this book uh, from 2017, 2018. It was published just before the pandemic. And we, uh, we were uh, very surprised by how... Uh, uh, premonitory is this title ended up being. Um, so this this talk is uh, um, trying to apply this kind of pragmatic, uh, you know, common sense kind you know, of mix to uh, to the issues of climate. Uh, that is a little bit the hallmark of of my work, as Dr. Adesina pointed out. So. In the, in the summer of 2020, in the, in the height of the COVID pandemic, uh, one could have thought that maybe there was going to be a, a sort of new urgency on climate change. Uh, this is a picture taken from uh, uh, San Francisco, where you can see the, 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 the sky as this orange hue uh, due to the uh, dramatic forest fires that um, affected the region at the time. And between that and the pandemic, I think in the summer of 2020, even in the US where climate change is not really at the forefront of the policy or media conversation most of the time, uh, suddenly you started to think, okay, maybe this is something we now really, really need to address. And then of course, as most things, it sort of receded into the, into the, into the background, into the shadow. Um, and only to, to sort of reappear around the, the, the COP26 uh, summit earlier this fall. 
Uh, what I want to talk about today is I want to kind of explain uh, why I think the problem is, uh, uh, why is it that in the West we don't seem to be able to, to focus on the issue of climate change uh, for more than five minutes at a time, and why this is uh, a, a big problem uh, for Africa and uh, for the developing world more generally, uh, this lack of attention and therefore what we can try and hope to do about it. Um, so the first part of my argument is that uh, the emissions that are responsible for climate change are mainly due to the behavior of rich country citizens. So of course we know that simply by looking at emissions, that uh, if we look at contemporary emissions, we are seeing them mostly in North America, in Europe, but also in, uh, in China and, the US, and India, certainly not in Africa. So one could say, well, you know, this is, this is not just a rich country citizen, it's also China, uh, it's also India, so, you know, everybody has to get their acts together. Uh, to which one argument that often countries uh, are opposed to that, in particular the poor countries' emerging economies, that historically, the historic emission, which are of course, and it's of course in this case, it's a stock of emissions that matter, not the flow. The historic emissions are uh, mainly took place in and during the starting with the industrial revolution in one is, what is today the, the Western world. But there is another argument, which is that uh, even when things are produced in uh, in China, India, or for that matter, in Ethiopia or elsewhere in Africa. They are often produced not to be consumed in those countries, but to be consumed in Europe or the US. So even if the emission doesn't take place mechanically in Paris, if it's to uh, produce a, 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 a piece of fast fashion that is sold in a Zara shop in Paris, that, in a sense, is, in my opinion, should go on the book as being responsible for the responsibility of rich countries. So, in other words, the uh, emission of climate change are, are directly related to the consumption pattern of, of, the, of people in, uh, in various countries, and therefore it's connected uh, to inequality worldwide. So, uh, Thomas Piketty and Lucas Chancel, a few years ago, tried to estimate uh, how much you know, this consumption uh, uh, CO2e, uh, which has CO2 equivalent emission, which tells us how much of um, the emissions are emitted in order to produce the consumption of those countries. And once you do that, what you're finding is something that can be loosely characterized as the 1050 rules, which is on the one hand, 10% of the highest polluters are responsible for about 50% of global emissions. And 50% of the bottom emitters are, uh, are responsible for 13% of, of the world emission. So that's the first uh, fact, is that then if you put it this way, it's even starker than if we look at, at just the emissions, once we, once we take into account the fact that it's for... Uh, it, it's, this, these emissions are there for the consumption in each country. The second uh, issue is that uh, the cost of climate change, so the, the cause of climate change is mainly to be found in the rich countries, but the cost of climate change are going to be felt uh, essentially in the poor part of the world as we move forward. This is for two reasons. Uh, there is a mechanical reason, which is the poorest part of the world tend to be in regions which are already warm, uh, so, for example, a lot of Africa, uh, the Sahel region, is already warm to start with. It's already warmer. And the, so what this means is that, so this is the temperatures today that illustrate this point, which you know very well, that poor country, poorer countries tend to be in warmer places, where you can see the big red bands in, the, uh, uh, in northern Africa, in the, in the Sahel in particular. And then as we move along, that means that it's in the, the poorer countries that we are going to see more extremely hot days, so days that are above uh, 32 degrees uh, centigrade. Why is it a relevant day, uh, relevant threshold? I'm going to show you in a moment that the cost of climate, uh, the cost of high temperature are not linear. And they are not even monotonous because if you go from a, a very, very cold winter at minus 10 centigrade to a slightly 
less cold winter, which is what's going to happen in Sweden. And that's a good thing because people, you know, die when it's too, too cold and the agriculture suffers from the cold. So in very cold places, uh, the fact that we are warming the planet is not going to make much of a difference or it's even going to help. Even at the regular temperature, you know, if you go from 20 to 22, uh, which is, you know, maybe what's going to happen in France and Brittany, then that's fine. But where you're starting to see damages, both on the economy and on human health, is when the, the days become super hot. So a shortcut for, the, for that, an effective shortcut, is to count the number of days in the year that are above 32 degrees centigrade. And if we do that, it's really, again, in poor countries that we are going, you know, in most of Africa uh, and in, you know, a part of Brazil, in India, uh, and in South Asia general, that we are going to see more uh, uh, of these very hot days, more days added that are above 32, uh, 32 degrees centigrade. If we are looking at 2050, that's even starker, uh, with uh, many, many hot days added by 2050 under the current uh, IPCC put, uh, projection. So that's the first thing, which is poor countries, in particular African countries, tend to be in already warmer places. And then even if climate change was kind of equally across countries, just mechanically, they're going to have many hotter days, and the hotter, hotter days are more costly in general. To this, you need to add a second problem, which is the cost of a given hot days, both in terms of the economic implication, so reduced output, but even uh, more seriously in terms of the human health uh, complications, and in particular in terms of the probability of death, is uh, not the same in poorer countries and in richer countries. Uh, what is the reasons for that? Well, it's because richer countries have all sorts of technologies that they can use to uh, adapt uh, to warmer temperature. Uh, for example, uh, they work in warehouses that in principle could be uh, air conditioned. They don't work outside as much. Uh, they are not as dependent on agriculture, which is uh, directly dependent on the climate. So these are for the economic shock. So when it gets very hot uh, in an Indian form, uh, you, the, the, the workers are just uh, less productive because they are just they are literally melting. Uh, same thing in a, in an African farm. When it gets very hot in a farm in Texas, uh, it, you know the the, the 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 air can be there can be air conditioning, and also people in Texas in any case are less likely to be doing hard demanding physical jobs. So that's the first problem. The, the, so there is this. Uh, uh, the mitigation technology uh, and for health, for human health, that's the same thing as well, which is when you get very hot days but people are able to go to cooler places, either in their own home or in, you know, in places that are organized for them, then that saves their lives. Uh, if you live in a village where there is no air conditioning, then you cannot. So the consequence of that is that if you're looking at the impact of, this, of a, a given number of days in uh, looking now at historical weather patterns, you can look at uh, you can look around, uh, compare regions in the world which had more of uh, warm days or very hot days or very very hot days. So here in this graph now it's in Fahrenheit. So uh, the benchmark is seven to seventy four Fahrenheit, which is kind of a nice mild uh, day in the twenties. And um, the, each point after that compares uh, the mortality in a given small region uh, in years where there were more of these relatively warmer days, uh, so 75 and plus, 82, 84, I don't know. And what you can see if you look at the red graph, which is India, is that when you have many days above 90, so that's the 32 degrees I was talking about, and even more 95, you're seeing many more deaths uh, in those districts that had more of those uh, very hot days compared to the uh, places that had mostly cool days. Now, if we are looking at the US, we are finding that that's just not true as much. There is a small uptick in mortality for the very high temperature, but it's considerably smaller. Uh, and this is today, comparing India and the US today, we know it's because of technology. And one way to see it is that if we did the same graph for the US historically and today, 
the US used to look like India 30 years ago uh, in terms of the mortality associated with hot days. But today, of course, it looks like the US. So the cost in terms of mortality, as well as the economic costs of the same warming would also be higher in poor countries than they are in rich countries. And in addition, you get more hot days. So you really get hammered on both sides of the equation. The consequence of that is that if you estimate the mortality cost over the next 20 years, and that's, a, that, by the way, a map that is put together by the um, uh, center uh, at Chicago called EPIC, uh, led by Michael Greenstone and a consortium of, of researchers from all over the U.S. that are putting these estimates together. And look at the mortality cost as, uh, that you can estimate from uh, uh, in using the IPCC uh, uh, um, projection on climate and combining them with the mortality cost by region. And you're seeing that the mortality costs are going to be the highest in Africa. They are negative in Sweden. You know, blue indicates that it's a benefit. Uh, and then by mid-century, you get this big red blotch uh, in 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 the northern part of Africa, all the way to, to the Sahel. So this is uh, the, the second point, which is that even though the responsibility is essentially in the West uh, and to, cons to, to kind of, uh, for the consumption of the richest people around the world, the costs are mainly in African countries uh, in terms of mortality and in terms of economic costs as well. The third point I want to make is that we can't wait for the catastrophe that I'm talking about. So I'm predicting you some catastrophe that is going to be mainly happening in Africa. And uh, we, it really has to, we really have to act now uh, if we want to hope to, to be able to, to, to deal with that. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, it's basically the consequence of the COVID-19 crisis and the way that the that the, the COVID-19 crisis was handled by rich countries. Um, so immediately after uh, the, the, you know, the countries went into lockdown in, uh, in March of 2020, rich countries started spending large amounts of money on their own citizens. So on average, the IMF estimates that they spend about 20% in fiscal stimulus measures on their own citizens. That's literally trillions of dollars. In the poor countries, uh, this was not possible because they, they didn't have the, the credit standing to be able to borrow, to, to finance that. So despite the, the economic cost of the poor countries, there was no immediate or, in fact, uh, delayed in, uh, substantive, substantial increase in economic aid towards the poor countries, with the consequence that the poorest countries, most of them in Africa, spend only 2% of their GDP on stimulus measures. So while the rich countries spend 20% of a large GDP, the, the poor countries spend 2% of a small GDP, which clearly was not enough. And this is not by lack of trying. Um, I was in particular uh, uh, working with the, the government of, of Togo that put together a very innovative program uh, called Novisi, uh, which was basically a, a support system for small cash transfers to people who were affected by the lockdown. That program was put in place very rapidly. It was there. They needed money to run it. And it was very difficult to run, to, to get enough money to, to, to run it. And um, so this is just like one example saying that the, the, the creativity, in fact, the, the, the African Development Bank yourself had a call to say we, uh, we need to, uh, to be able to raise resources to, to, to do direct cash transfer to people affected by lockdown. But we need the money. And this just didn't happen. Uh, if you look at the increase in aid from uh, the OECD, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, you, you don't get a, a very large increase. You get a little bit, but uh, very, very small in comparison to the needs and also in comparison to what was done in rich countries. It really would have been a rounding error. Uh, Abhijit Panazi and I had called uh, as early as April for a Marshall Plan towards poor countries in order to kind of get ready to bounce back from the economic shock of the COVID, uh, but nothing happened. Um, 
And then, of course, uh, we are seeing the exact, uh, you know, we have seen the exact same thing happening with vaccination, where, uh, you know, the, the, the attempt to vaccinate uh, the, the, the world was a complete, uh, complete failure until today. Uh, the right words are being said, uh, but, uh, but nothing is actually done to make it happen. And when you have uh, something like Omicron showing up, what it provokes is, is, is another panicking closing of the borders instead of, of, of a reflection on saying, oh, maybe we would not be in this position if more people were, were vaccinated. So I think this, what it's telling us um, uh, is that the, the, the leadership, the, the international leadership in such, is in such a shape today that uh, as soon as a crisis happens, it seems that leaders are like deers in the headlights and unable to, to kind of realize what makes sense uh, from an ethical uh, point of view, but also from a pragmatic point of view of, for in this particular case, in case uh, stopping the pandemic. The same thing will happen if we have huge climate catastrophe happening uh, in, in in Africa, where if we're seeing a lot of people, you know, displaced by droughts or unable to, to survive. Um, I don't think we can count at this time in a, in a swift reaction to the rich countries in period of in this period of crisis. So the only way to to get something done, I think, is to do it when there is when there is front of us and, and no panic and we can we can uh, you know get our acts together so that's why we need to act now now how to to act well one thing that uh, uh, keeps coming back is that uh, in climate discussion is that you can kind of address the issue by technological uh, discussions the hope is that eventually it will be sufficient to produce more efficiently with better and cleaner technologies. Uh, for example, uh, uh, solar batteries have become uh, uh, much, much cheaper over time, and eventually the hope is that they become sufficiently cheap that they will just uh, displace the old and, and dirty technologies. However, you know, it is possible uh, that something like that will happen. Similarly, we are now talking about the technological solution for carbon capture and saying that that's the solution. But here I want to point out that uh, the impact of purely technological solution is often very disappointing in real life. Uh, we have conducted with GPAL several randomized control trials on this, this kind of technological uh, uh, solutions which are the type of things that people buy when they buy carbon credit to offset their trips. Uh, one example is a big uh, program of home weatherization that took place in the US where they found that, so this was to make uh, the houses more resistant to the cold and therefore reduce the energy consumption of the house. And they found that those who, uh, who were given this, this assistance, their house were not actually that much uh, cleaner and, and that much less polluting, so that there was really little impact of the of, of this weatherization on energy consumption. Why? You know, perhaps because people uh, opened their windows more or just made the crank up the heat or something like that. Similarly, in in, in India, there was a program. There is this idea that there are all these uh, dollar bills lying on the ground. The firms are inefficient in terms of their energy, and we can fix it. Um, and uh, they. Nick Ryan evaluated a program where firms were given consulting as well as loans to improve their energy efficiency. And they happily did that, but instead of them, therefore, saving energy, they just produced more so that it might be good for them and for their profit, but it did nothing for the planet. So it's not going to be sufficient to, to go for technology alone. However, I think so. it will be necessary to change behavior, to just consume differently, uh, and in particular in the West, because I don't think we can uh, tell uh, with a straight face to people in Africa that they have to consume less when they, in fact, need to consume more, in particular to consume more of the technologies that are going to protect them against Chinese change. And there, are often, people are a little bit, uh, um, particular economists are a bit dep depressed about the possibility to change behavior. But I think that's too, um, that's that's in fact too pessimistic. We underestimate the capacity of the human being for change. Our preferences are not set at, at birth. They are not immutable. They are the product of the social environment, and they are affected by habit, which means we are creature of habit. If we've done something, we continue to do it. 
Let me give you an example of that, which is an experiment conducted by Hunt Alcott with uh, uh, the uh, company O Power in the US. So O Power sends you this uh, mailing, so uh, once in a quarter or so, that provides you with uh, a, a, a report card on how ener energy efficient you are in your house. So you can see an example of a report card on top here. Um, whether you're more efficient uh, than your most efficient neighbor and you're more efficient than everyone. So this person, for example, is efficient. Uh, so uh, what many experiments, including Hans, have shown is that when people are randomly selected to get this mailing, uh, they, they are more, uh, they, they increase, they decrease their energy consumption. That's what you can see in the red bars here. After a few months, you know, after the zero is a few months after the experiment, energy consumption goes down uh, six and seven months after the experiment compared to, to in treatment compared to control. So that's treatment effect over time on the left graph. On the right graph now, what you're seeing what happens uh, in two groups, one group that continue receiving the mailings, uh, this is in black, and you can see that they continue, their, their decrease is larger and larger, presumably as they make other investments, uh, more and more investments to, to reduce their energy consumption. But I want to draw your attention to the blue group and, and show you that it doesn't, uh, once they stop receiving the mailing after the, the, the orange line, they don't continue to go down, but they don't go back up. So basically, whatever changes they made during the moment where they, get, they got the mailings, they, they continued them. So that's important for two reasons. One, it shows that uh, uh, you know establishing the, the social norm uh, is uh, effective in terms of leading to less energy consumption, and two, it shows that uh, uh, this is actually persistent over time. The first point I want to make is that we can't tackle climate change without tackling two things: one is redistribution, and one is trust in government. Uh, let me talk about these two in terms. So this is a photo that was taken in France during the Yellow Vest movement. And what's, uh, uh, you might not remember that the Yellow Vest movement, which was a big move, uh, movement of protestation that lasted weeks and weeks and weeks, was initially sparked by a proposed uh, carbon tax, which would have led to an increase in the petrol at the pump. And here's what the jacket says, money for climate change is not in fiscal is in fiscal to be found in fiscal paradises, paradises not in the pocket of the proletariat. Uh, angry uh, citizens. So what does this mean is that the way that uh, people in France uh, and many other places understand a uh, uh, carbon tax is that it's a way of financing either the government or maybe climate change fight not as the way that most economists understand it, which is it's just a way of setting the, the incentives right, correcting the externalities, and letting uh, 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 giving people incentives to do, to do the right things. So people see, do, see this as the incidence is going to fall directly on them, and they don't think it's fair. Uh, in particular, they don't see it's fair when they otherwise see uh, world inequality exploding, as we have seen, uh, uh, for example, with the most recent report from the World Inequality Lab, that it has continued and even accelerated during the pandemic, and when they see that uh, most rich people evade, evade taxes altogether. So without redistribution, without a clear point that... Uh, the money that is being raised uh, through carbon taxes is not going to be uh, um, you know, put in the general government, but it's going to be redistributed to people who are directly affected, then you cannot, I think, succeed there. And climate change is always going to be seen as something for the rich. Uh, people are more concerned by end of the month than by end of the world, and, uh, and they, 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 they don't have the, the, the bandwidth to think about people in the poor world that are going to to, to really suffer from climate change. And I think we can, um, we can give them this bandwidth if we are making it clear that that's not going to affect their, their immediate bottom line. But once you try to do that, the problem is people have to trust you. Uh, in India, they tried, in Punjab, they tried to, uh, to stop uh, giving free electricity to farmers. Uh, and they... Uh, uh, they had a plan of saying we are going to now charge you for electricity. The reason why it's important is that electricity is used to power pump that 
pump water, which is bad for farmers because it eventually uh, just uh, uh, completely uh, empty the, the, the water table. So the idea is to give them the right incentive by charging them for electricity, but then uh, compensating them by 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 paying a fixed by giving them a fixed uh, uh, payment for everyone. And uh, nobody trusts that second part, and therefore this is treated as a midsummer madness and 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 not uh, taken seriously. Another reason why you need to have credibility and trust in governments is because once, even if you don't have carbon taxes, you have regulation instead, the regulations need to be enforced. Uh, and this is uh, um, data from India, uh, where you see on the top graph, uh, you know, the audit data for firms. So firms have to get a private audit to show that they are in compliance with regulation. And if you see the audit data, uh, uh, this is uh, in each bar here is a histogram of how many firms we are finding with pollution at different levels. And you can see that most firms are just under the official threshold for pollution. That's according to the audit data that they submit to the government. But then when we sent university students to do back checks of these audits, we realized that these audit data were all made up because the true distribution you're seeing down, in fact, most firms are above uh, the pollution. So the regulation is not at all respected. Everybody knows it. Uh, and there is no credibility or power for the government to enforce it. So in conclusion, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, in a sense, is, a, is an opportunity for climate change. Uh, first of all, it reminds us that sometimes nature is just stronger than us. And I think that it's, some, it's a message that human beings have, have a lot of difficulty to, to uh, uh, understand because we have what's called uh, projection bias. We're thinking the future is going to be exactly like today. It shows us that sometimes uh, dire warnings by experts come to pass. It shows us that sometimes we do need government to steer collective, collective action, and it also shows us that we can change our lifestyle without being so unhappy about it. Uh, I must say that uh, I, I started putting, uh, you know, having this thinking during the crisis itself, the crisis having kind of come and not really gone, uh, uh, and then Glasgow having come and finished on a relatively disappointing note, I'm less enthusiastic. But uh, when I, you know, last year I lived in, in uh, very near uh, the Bastille Place, and when I see everyone circulating on their bicycles, I'm thinking that maybe there is a hope there. Uh, thank you very much again for your invitation, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Esther Donklow. We're truly indebted to you for an excellent uh, keynote today. You've given us much to unpack, so may I crave your indulgence and ask our virtual global audience to give you a warm round of applause at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Well, which we're going to transition very quickly and um, go on to our next segment uh, in this 2021 Kofi Annan Eminence Lect Speakers Lecture Series which will be a moderated Q&A and conversation between yourself, uh, Professor Dufflow, and Dr. Akimumi Adishina. But I, I really want to, you said quite a number of intriguing things, but th there's one that you said that just jumped out at me. You said richer countries will try to save themselves first. That is a powerful message for the developing world indeed for Africa. So my question to yourself and to Dr. Adeshna simply is this. Was COP26 in Glasgow a success? And do you think that there's the political will to meet the commitments? And in addition to that, is there a commitment to ensure that committed funds are properly disbursed? I'll start with Dr. Adeshna first and then come to you. Professor Well, first, let me, uh, before I go into those questions, let me first and foremost thank you very much, uh, Professor Duflo, for a brilliant and very insightful lecture that you have given us uh, today. Lots of food for thought there. Uh, I was saying to you when I was introducing you, this is what I call common sense economics, you know, and common sense economic with good theory that I actually tries to address the major things of our time, challenges of our time. And you mentioned something which is related to what Victor was asking about, about Glasgow. In fact, without it, we will not be 
in Glasgow, which was all about the issue of emissions. And you mentioned two things. You said emissions is not just about flows, but it's also about the stock of emissions that you have. And that, for me, is a fundamental starting point because it actually says that the growth trajectory that developed countries have had with industrial revolution and all of that is what has actually driven the greenhouse gas emissions we have in the world today to the stock levels that we are dealing with today. And therefore, if that then being the case, which it is, then we must ask ourselves fundamentally the question, what is the polluter principle pay principle? How do you apply that when the polluter refuses to, to pay? And when the polluter decides how much they want to pay and when they want to pay it. And yet you have those that are affected using almost nothing that are at the receiving end, as you rightly said, of the climate change. And so one point that I raised, Victor, in, in Glasgow is that for us to really solve this problem on a long-term basis, we must change how we measure wealth creation in the world. Because when you measure wealth in terms of gross domestic product, it's basically the value of goods and services that an economic produces. But it doesn't tell you anything about how it is produced. It doesn't tell you anything about the technology that produces it. It doesn't tell you anything about the negative externalities of it on the environment, and in particular, how it damages the global biosphere. So basically, you have today countries that are called very rich countries. Yes, they are rich when you look at it in terms of monetary terms, but are they? Because they are rich at the expense of others. They've made others poorer by their wealth because they are basically are, are, are polluting the world. And that's what happened. So, you know, Professor Duflo, you know, I have been a big uh, advocate of the need for us to weight GDP of countries by the extent of negative externalities that they create. And so if you are actually going to do that, you will find that today's, a lot of today's rich countries will actually be poorer than they think they are, because it, it means that we take into consideration not just the value of the goods and services you are producing, but how you're producing it and the cost that we attach to that. So Victor, on the global stage, that remains an issue because as far as I'm concerned, and I think Professor is right, on a long-term basis, as we change what we incentivize, we will continue to do the same thing. She made a statement, she says, basically rounding errors. We'll continue just to do inframarginal shifts. So we got to shift what we measure and make sure we are measuring the right things about what wealth is. Nobody should develop at the expense of others. That's the first thing. Secondly, is the willingness to pay. Professor Duflo mentioned the cost. You know, it was so sobering listening to her about the rising temperatures, the impact on mortality in, in Africa, in the poorer countries, and so on and so forth. But where are the resources to support the developing countries to make the adjustments for what they didn't cost. Today you have only 5% of global climate finance going into adaptation for the countries that have no choice but to adapt. And for so long, we've all been talking about the $100 billion that the developed countries promised to give developing countries to allow them to adjust. Professor talked about the issue of technology. Yes, technology matters. They have to be able to adjust their adjustment costs, their time lags. There are also economics of how you make sure that if you are using renewable energy because the cost is so high, who pays for the economic viability gap? And, and, and these are the things that were agreed. But when the developed countries postponed to 2023, again, what was actually promised in 2009? You can understand why Professor Duflo made that point about a crisis of trust when she was talking about trust and governance. Kofi Annan that we are speaking on his platform today, you know, he was a mentor of mine and he told me one thing one day. He said, Akin, the only promises that matter are the promises that are kept. And so there is an erosion of global trust because people don't believe that in 2023 that's going to be 
happening because it's easier to postpone things that affect developing countries. But when it affects developed countries, it gets action today. And so how many people will die between now and 2023? How much temperature, Professor just showed you, how many 32 degrees centigrade, how many people will die in that situation? Even if we got a $100 billion in 2023, will it bring them back? So we must prioritize trust, global trust, and there must be global accountability. When you talked about, was it a great success in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Glasgow? For me, Glasgow was a, a point where we have to look at ourselves once and for all in the mirror and ask ourselves like Mark Jackson, I'm talking about the man in the mirror. I'm asking them to change their ways. So we must show leadership. We must show accountability. We must show responsiveness. And we must deliver on what was promised. You know, promises don't matter. What matters are the resources for the developing countries to be able to achieve. And I think that Glasgow, in that, there were I mean, uh, things done, I mean, which are fine, but when it comes to the global issue, I think the world did not reach that. And last thing I want to say, Victor, on this one is sometimes it's so easy to push the issue to others. So, for example, we talk quite a lot about, say, well, we need trillions of dollars to adapt to climate change, what the Professor was talking about. And suddenly, oh, we're going to have the private sector that are going to come up with all of that money. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. Governments have to come up with resources to support climate adaptation. Africa will need at least $330, $63 billion by 2030 to adapt to climate change. We will need more resources. All I'm trying to say is that let's show leadership once and for all. I, I'm, I'm so inspired by what Professor said, the urgency of now. But I think the most important thing is the urgency of the resources today to avoid the consequences that are irretrievable once they have already occurred. So all I have to say, I think the jury is still out on that. Thank, thank you, Dr. Adishina. Really appreciate that. And Professor Dufflow, and coming to you again, just following on what Dr. Adishina just said, you said nature is stronger than us. Climate change is not waiting for us. Uh, change is happening inevitably. So the question still is, is there a commitment, a political will to meet the commitments that have been made? And if there isn't, what is it that the developing world and Africa can do? So I think this, this question of, I don't know if there is this commitment and I um, it breaks hard to say that, but uh, um, this issue of trust that uh, Dr. Adesina highlighted, you know, for the international, in, inter, at the international level, you know, do I trust the richer countries that are responsible both for the historical emission and for the bulk of the emission today? Actually, the flows continue, which is uh, uh, relevant as well. Um, do I trust them to do things uh, on the... Uh, uh, on behalf of the entire world or, or not. And I tend to be an optimist and see the world as a, the, the glass uh, as half full uh, most of the time. But really the, 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 the dramatic failure uh, on the uh, COVID-19 vaccination um, put a damper on my uh, willingness to trust any commitment that was made. Um, both on the mission and on money. It, it, when you think of the COVID vaccination, it was a, a fantastic opportunity. In fact, in the run-up to the G8 uh, summit, the IMF uh, came up with uh, a, a, an estimate of uh, $50 billion uh, uh, of a post cost package to help uh, Covax help uh, all of the, you know, most of the countries in the world to vaccinate their their population within two years up to sixty percent or eighty percent. Fifty billion dollars, that's the rounding error, you know, compared to what was spent in rich countries on COVID, and they estimated the potential benefit to the world to be nine trillion. 
you know, you can, you know, give and take whatever, <laughs> even remove a zero, and still, it was such an obvious uh, uh, economic win-win. So they did that in, uh, they, they wrote that in the rot up. They, they 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 got everyone aligned behind their, uh, behind this plan. Uh, Abhijit Banerjee and I wrote an op-ed to make a different point, which is to say, look, this is such a fantastic opportunity to demonstrate to the world that we can do things together and we can do things for the common good. Because frankly, this was so easy compared to other things. You know, lifting countries out of poverty is difficult. Like there are so many things that needs to be done. You know, each problem needs to be tackled by one by one. Producing, shipping, logistics of a vaccine, that's not difficult in the scale of that because that's one problem on which we actually have scores of experience, African countries in particular, have historically been excellent at vaccinating their population. They have, uh, you know, most governments have the logistics and uh, the, the con have convinced their populations, etc. There was a window op of opportunity that if we had wanted to do it, we could have done it. And I, nothing will convince me that this was a hard problem. Inventing the vaccine was a hard problem. Uh, persuading people in Alabama to take it is a hard problem shipping enough doses to Africa and getting people to get vaccinated there is not a hard problem. And yet, it wasn't done. It, it wasn't done. And this was not by failure of making commitments and making big speeches. And in fact, this was probably one of the most frustrating uh, moments of my, you know, sort of uh, fledgling uh, public career, which is, you can't have a conversation with anybody on it because everybody agrees with you. That of course, there is nothing more important than vaccinated Africa. It's like, why aren't you getting your acts together? I, just, I can't understand it. There, there were many ways to do it. Money, I think, was, you know, hard cash would have done it. Uh, uh, sharing property rights would have done it. And then, you, you know, you choose your ways, you know, supporting South Africa, uh, Korea, India, uh, you know, and... Um, I'm sure there were other countries in Africa that were ready, would have been ready to manufacture uh, vaccines by now, and this didn't happen. So you might say, why am I talking of COVID-19 in the middle of, the, of a discussion on climate? It's because if we cannot get... So we had this golden opportunity of demonstrating commitment to the world as one planet in something that was obviously in the self-interest of the rich countries, not in 50 years, but like Today, now, like in two years, we see it with Omicron demonstrated. And the African scientists like shrugging their shoulders and saying, we told you so. We knew it was going to happen. And not in 50 years, like the problem of climate change, but tomorrow. Or in fact, today, because Omicron is today. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it didn't happen. So therefore, for climate, you can think, you know, how can we trust the commitment, both on money and on emission, how can developing countries, African countries, trust the commitment after this happened? I don't know. I, I'm a little bit at a loss. Thank you, Professor, which leads me really to the, to, the, to I want to make a connection here on a very important point. You talked about the credibility of trust, um, which is significantly important. Um, but even as we talk about climate change and an energy transition and more recently, particularly with regards to Africa, a just energy transition that will enable Africa to get out of fossil fuels. How fair are these calls for developing countries, especially Africa? Again, Professor, I, I, I'll come to you in a second. I, I just want to hear from Dr. Adishna here. Um, what, what are your thoughts um, on this? Because again, central to all of this is an issue of uh, self-interest, as Professor has said, but also the issue of credibility and trust. Your thoughts, Dr. Adishna? Well, you know, um, I think first is um, to recognize that um, Africa has a lot of resources that it can use uh, as part of the um, issue of energy mix generation. So today you look at how much 
potential, if you can talk potential, you're talking Africa has 11 terawatts of uh, solar energy resources. It has about 350 mega, I mean, gigawatts of resources for hydro, about 150 uh, 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 um, uh, uh, gigawatts potential um, also for wind and, uh, and of course you have geothermal and, and all the others. But the key is nobody eats potential. Potential means nothing. You have to translate it into something. That's why for us at the African Development Bank, you know, we really believe that Africa should optimize all of what it has in terms of renewable energy. As you know, we, we are investing uh, together with others, um, you know, $20 billion program uh, was called Desert to Power. You know, Professor uh, Dufle was talking about the Sahel, you know, and uh, this is to produce, uh, to, I mean, to uh, uh, have about 10,000 megawatts of solar power in the Sahel that will provide electricity for 250 million people, which will transform the lives of people. We did the Lake Tukana project in, uh, in Kenya, which is uh, the, the, the largest, um, you know, uh, uh, wind power station that you have uh, in Africa. You look at Morocco in North Africa, we have that the new Wazazate, which is in Morocco and all of those. So all that to say that Africa will continue to do that. But here is the issue. We are leading on renewable energy and we will continue to lead on that. There's no doubt in my mind. Because if you look at how much we're investing on in it, 83% of the bank's investment in energy generation today is actually coming from renewable energy. So we've made that transition. I could just go back 200, 2001 to 2010, it was only 9% then. So we are in the right direction. However, three things are important in my view when we talk about energy. First is access. The second is affordability. And the third is security of supply or the stability of energy systems. Now, but you can't really have that unless you have an energy mix that allows you to do that. And I'm coming back to what the professor was saying earlier on. Developed countries have built that for centuries. They built it from coal. They built it from gas. They built it from hydro. They built it also from nuclear, right? And so they've had the opportunity to accumulate significant amount of resources and wealth which then allows them then to focus on R&D that allows them to make the energy transitions that they should make because, you know, Africa is not contributing anything, right? So it's developed countries that actually, but they've, they have the technology, they have the R&D, and they have the wealth to compensate for people when they are moving into renewable energy that is much expensive, then you can actually compensate people for that. In fact, Professor, what you were saying about France, even when the energy shocks actually happened recently, the government had to provide uh, 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 some coupons to, to households to deal with that. You don't have those opportunities in Africa. Now, but I've had people say, well, Africa should get out of gas. Well, let me say that Africa absolutely needs gas because you need gas to have a stable energy grid system because Africa has to industrialize you know, Africa is not going to be poor in a very environmentally green manner, right? So it needs to have what the professor said at the beginning, give Africa space to grow, right? Others may change their consumption patterns, he says, but let Africa actually have it. If you, if you, if you, I was just looking at one thing before, uh, a few days ago, was going around on the, on, the, on the social media, and it was sent to me by one of my staff, and it was looking at the energy use per person in the United States, um, by a United States ref refrigerator in the U.S. compared in terms of annual kilowatt hour of electricity consumed per capita in 2017 and comparing it to electricity consumption per person in Africa. Ethiopia is 89. Tanzania, 109. That is kilowatts per hour of electricity per capita. Nigeria, 135. Kenya, 168. A U.S. fridge, a refrigerator, is 459. Just tells you, therefore, that when we are talking about energy transition, we must realize that the developed countries that have actually um, created a lot of this are the ones that need to transition first. In fact, that's what we actually agreed on in the, in the, in the, um, in the Paris Agreement. 
But if you are transitioning, let me give you an example of how it, it feels like. If you like to go on cruises, which we all like to go on cruises, so you have a, a, a cruise ship, that cruise ship is moving, you can get out of your room, you go play some badminton, you play some, uh, some games and so on, but the ship is stable. That is how energy transition is for developed countries. Everything is stable because they have 100% electricity, access, affordability, and security. For a developing country like African countries, it's like a small rickety canoe set on the Mediterranean Sea, moving here, moving here. If you move on one side to the other, you're going to flip over. So all I'm trying to say by that is we must also talk about not just, just energy transition. We must talk about just energy systems, building just energy systems that will allow for increased productivity, increased product, uh, uh, quality of life, and to recognize even if Africa today were to use all, I mean, three times the gas that it currently uses, three times and uses it to produce electricity. You know how much it will have contributed to greenhouse gas emissions? Globally, 0.67%. That's all. And yet we must understand that today, the reason why we are having a lot of problems with uh, energy in Africa is not because of the energy sector. It is because of land use. People are relying on coal, charcoal, and fuel wood. That's not how to live, right? So we're not going to live at such a low level of, of, of productivity, right, in Africa, while others have the luxury of doing that. She just told you about the case of when the heat waves come and people have access to, to, to air conditioning, well, to get air conditioning, you, use, you need to have stable power. In Africa, you don't even have that. So all I'm trying to say is that not only must we talk about just energy transitions, we must talk about building just energy systems that will allow better quality of life for Africa. After all, Africa didn't contribute more than 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we should not be penalized in terms of quality of life. Even as we build our energy systems in a green way, it has to be a balanced one that allows our, our, our continent to industrialize and to grow and to develop and have better quality of life. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Adishina, and um, thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Duflo, you, you've been known actually to talk about the need to deal with global issues um, in more compact ways, in subsystemic ways. With regards to what Dr. Adina just said, how important is that for both development and for climate change, in your view? Now, it's, it's really essential because when we get to the, you know, once we agree on the broad framework, we just certainly would agree with. I think the, the point is that uh, just if we frame it in the context of climate change, African countries need to be to have the resource to adapt to the climate change that already exists, and 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 ideally to do that in a way that is not endangering the, the future, and, and so and that will take sustained investment uh, uh, in energy, uh, as in creative energy, and in and in money in particular to get that energy. Uh, grid done in a way that is not damaging to the future, but is also stable. And so once we get there and say, oh, okay, then how we need to, if we agree on that objective, then we need to move on to the detail of how we go to we go about implementing it. For example, uh, a lot of people have, uh, have, have suggested for Africa that off-grid solutions are, uh, you know, good solutions that uh, people can have small uh, solar systems or uh, but you know how what is the demand for that at what price will people take it up uh, how uh, how much of a difference is it going to, to to do to them what's the difference between that and being connected to the grid and so on and so forth so that's one example another example is that one way in which we can uh, um, Another resources that, that Africa has, for example, is, is forest. It already has some woods uh, in place. And one of the way that we prevent climate change is by not cutting them down. Uh, but what will be effective in, uh, you know, can people be paid to conserve the trees that are on their land? How much need they, do, do they need to be paid? There is, for example, a very interesting experiment on that in Uganda for paying people for conserving the trees. And then that leads to all of the 
questions of how you set up the program, how you to verify the program, is it effective in terms of people conserving, is it effective in, people, in, in terms of increasing people's uh, living standards because they are now paid for their trees, and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's through a series of this, like, De- look at detailed policies and options that we we you know we chart the best course to arrive at uh, the the sustained objective, which is you know both imp- in- increasing the economic welfare, economic well-being of people uh, in Africa, and doing it in a way that doesn't uh, um, uh, obviate their future uh, by 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 managing the environment. Yeah, can I come in, Victor, on that? on what uh, Professor just said. I wanted to make Absolutely, a... Absolutely Dr. Adishna, particularly if you're going to talk about Gabon and some of the work that you're doing in that, that area. Yeah, I think absolutely. it ties in very closely to what Professor just said. Yeah, no, I, I, indeed. You know, I, and I think that uh, one of the ways, um, I think, Professor, is what we look at how to change behavior. If we know that a lot of it comes from industries that are emitting a lot, is really having the right pricing for carbon uh, because it's very, very important to have the right carbon price. Um, I remember many years ago when I was uh, um, in Rockefeller Foundation and I was, I was in Kenya at the time, you know, it was early 2000. I remember somebody came to my office and talking about, oh, you know, the clean uh, development mechanisms and, uh, you know, carbon trading systems and how to make sure that, you know, people can plant trees and therefore, um, have carbon sequestration and then be able to um, to uh, trade it. But I asked how much is the price of carbon? And I was shocked how much I was told the price of carbon was. So if the price of carbon was like, what, $3 uh, per ton, which is what it is today, why would, anybody really, hmm? yeah, why would anybody really care about, uh, about, about, about that? So the price of carbon needs to be a very critical one that we make sure that people give incentives for people to do the right thing. And so you were mentioning the um, the the issue of uh, um, the um, forest cover. So, for example, you take the case of Gabon, and you take the case of uh, DRC Congo, and also the Congo Basin, entire Congo Basin, right? It's, it's some of the biggest peatlands that you that you have uh, in the world for basically sequestering carbon and all of that, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But question is this, they are not paid anything for having that. So what is the incentive for them to keep? They are contributing positively to a global uh, environment, but they are not compensated for it. So one of the things that I actually think we need to do is to have a permanent sink fund, carbon sink fund for Africa that will that will reward countries such as Gabon and, 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 and DRC and, 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 and Congo and others that are actually doing things that create global positive externalities for us and actually improves as well the whole issue around biodiversity for us. That's the first part. Second, coming back to the issue of metrics and what we measure. Again, if we look at those countries today, we will say, well, they have high debt to GDP ratios, right? This is the, that's the situation that they have. But let's think again. If they have high debt to GDP ratios, but if you actually consider the positive contributions that they make to the global environment, the biosphere in terms of the trees and the forest and the carbon that they're sinking and so on, why is it, based on what I was saying earlier on, when you weight GDP by the extent of positive or negative externalities that you create. Such countries, if you wait it, it means that their own GDP will rise, right? If that their GDP rises, that is already indexed by the, the uh, positive externalities, it means then that the debt to GDP ratio that has been indexed by the positive externalities that they create, their debt to GDP ratio, guess what? It goes down. That means they have more headroom to be able to have more resources to invest in more climate resilient um, uh, 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 investment and forest cover and all of that. So we do need to change, as they come back to the issue, we need to change what we are measuring because we seem to be using the wrong measures to address problems. You know, 
And so we have we have the we have, we, we have the real problem, but the instruments are the wrong instruments because we are measuring the wrong things. So that's what I wanted to say, Victor. And last thing I want to say about this issue is what happens, say, in the forest margins, and let's link it to agriculture and land use. Because most of the land use uh, emissions in Africa is coming from land use. So let's take agriculture. So when you're in the forest margin area, you have a pressure on the forest because people have to live, people have to eat, they need livelihoods for both forest and non-forest resources. However, if the productivity of agriculture is low, they have no choice. They have to grow their food production horizontally, not vertically. But if you have the right technologies, you can allow them to double, triple their yields, that will reduce the pressure they will have on the forest margins. And that's why the African Development Bank is investing massively in agriculture. To, we have a program called Technologies, Professor Duflo, that uh, is called the Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation. I'll be very happy to talk to you about it later and you can see how we can work together with MIT on some of the things that we are doing on this because what it has done, it, it has helped to double yields of crops. You take today in Sudan and in Ethiopia, we are helping farmers with heat tolerant crops of wheat, which is now grown on more than 1.2 million hectares, right? We are growing rice, farmers, over 3 million of them using highly productive rice technologies. And as production rise, productivity rises, it means that pressure on the land will reduce and that deforestation will actually literally reduce significantly. So I'm just saying that to say that we do need the right measures uh, for the problems where we are living. We need to re-index a lot of things we are doing so that those that are doing the right things are properly compensated. And I feel bad for countries like Gabon, DRC, and others that are keeping all this, even, even in the Amazon forest, because they are not properly compensated. The only thing that we hear about globally is debt to uh, 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 environmental uh, uh, swaps, right? But this is not new. Debt for environment swaps have been there since the 70s and early 80s. And they don't work at scale. They depend on donor financing, in most cases, they, 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 they develop concessional financing and private sector try to use it so that it can make better as debt for uh, 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 equity swap and things like that. But we need something else different. That's why I'm making the case that we do need to have a long-term carbon sink that actually rewards countries that are actually doing the right things. And then we re-index what we are measuring to make sure those that are doing things positive for the environment actually get compensated via a re-indexed GDP approach. Thank you, Dr. Adishna. Um, my my, my, my follow-up question from what you just said is to Professor Duffo. Um, I'm sure you're going to take Dr. Adishna up on the offer of the African Development Bank to work much more closely with you and MIT in the future. Uh, having said that, how can researchers and policy makers um, and those in the development space work a whole lot more better together, much more collaboratively and effectively to find and scale up high impact solutions that also support sustainable development. Your thoughts? Yes, we certainly will be delighted to do that. Um, uh, GPAL, uh, the network I, uh, I help fund, has an office in Africa, GPAL Africa, which is based out of uh, Cape Town, but is uh, uh, very happy to work in the entire region. And in fact, uh, um, Abhijit Banerjee, myself, and the Fund for Innovation and Development, which I, I chair uh, uh, in, in, in Paris, uh, we're hoping to run a conference in Abidjan uh, this uh, summer to put together uh, policymakers and, um, and researchers from the regions to start uh, uh, sharing ideas about problems and solutions to practical problems and evaluations and uh, uh, in particular to, to apply for funding from the Fund for Innovation Development which is precisely designed to, to help foster this, this uh, collaboration to ideate and uh, evalu ex experiment with and evaluate innovative ideas for development in particular uh, in, in Africa and in particular on climate. So that's one, uh, one tool that uh, uh, 
uh, uh, President Macron from France uh, uh, very much wanted uh, to see an existence that has been existing for now for one year. Uh, and that has uh, already uh, uh, financed uh, a few projects in Africa, and we're hoping to see many more coming forward. I, I wanted to uh, partly answer your question by going by also really uh, highlighting what uh, uh, Dr. Adesina mentioned about uh, the social cost of carbon. Uh, the price of carbon is today $59. Uh, it was uh, two under uh, in the Trump administration, uh, and then the Biden administration came back and put it back down to 59. Uh, and uh, most people have no idea what the social cost, cost of, of carbon is, and I think you were exp very right, and I think it should be known more widely how instrumental this piece of calculation is, because this is the one number that determines which regulation pass and don't pass, uh, what you can impose on firms, because we are looking at when we impose new regulation on firms, we are looking at the costs to the firm and then the benefit to the world, and the benefit is linked to the social cost of carbon. These are also the money that can, you know, if you if we were doing the type of things you proposed about weighting down the contribution to the environment, the social cost of carbon would come in. Now, why are researchers pertinent there? Well. Researchers are starting to argue that the social cost of carbon is all wrong because today it's calculated uh, uh, mainly in the U.S. considering the cost of climate change to the U.S. economy. Many things relevant here. First of all, it's the U.S. <laughs> Second of all, it's the economy and nothing else. And then finally, it also uses a, a, a discount rate that is very high, so it's, it's making us look extremely impatient and not look at the future. All of that needs to be changed. And in fact, the, the, the Michael Greenstone group, uh, the, which produced the map that I showed you in Chicago, ha, is a fantastic research effort to, to kind of recalculate the social cost of carbon from more sound basis, including the cost to human health and in particular to mortality because we know you know we have valuation for uh, for a life this is a bit uh, seems a bit cold to put uh, dollars on the life of people but it's relevant because then they can go in the social cost of carbon once we value life once we value life for the world once we change just doing that increasing life and valuing them for the world make the social cost of carbon jump to 329 dollars if in addition change the discount rate and we include the uh, 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 computed the economic cost in a finer way and so on and so forth that would further change and they have a whole roadmap for what needs to be done and that's really a kind of a joint effort between researcher and policymaker not the type of effort we do uh, in my lab because we are more in the evaluation and this is more into putting all of the numbers we already have together uh, but an important one uh, I Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't insist a bit more on JPAL, the Poverty Action Lab, which is precisely uh, uh, was born uh, out of the idea that we need to work to put together policymakers and researchers so that researchers have access to the questions that are in fact burning for policymakers, can do their research in a way that is directly informed by the priorities, in particular in developing countries, and therefore do more useful research. And also such that the findings that uh, researchers have found uh, get shared uh, uh, to uh, the wild world such that whatever is relevant in the different contexts can be adapted and skilled up. And uh, so JPA is now a little over, uh, uh, it's almost 20 years old in fact. And in, in 20 years, it's done a lot of work uh, trying to evaluate various aspects, working on this scale up today, uh, about uh, 700 million lives, or 650 million, I think is our latest count, lives have been affected by programs that GPAL researchers have been uh, found to be effective. But that number could be even higher if the collaboration was, was tighter. So I, in turn, uh, invite you guys to visit us uh, either at MIT or in Cape Town uh, or to uh, invite our teams to visit you in Abidjan and I'm certainly hoping to see you all uh, this summer. Victor, can I, can I just say something to, to Professor on the, I, I like what you said about the, the, the issue of the pricing of carbon and that's good in context of what I just mentioned to you. You know, Professor, it just, it just brought to my mind, you know, the 
the, the, the incredible work that Hernando de Soto did, you know, on the Ministry of Capital. And, and, and again, that the poor actually have a lot of assets, but that their assets are not well priced, and that's why they remain poor. And this is a very good example of that, that, you know, you've got countries that are in developing countries sitting on biodiversity, sitting on natural asset, natural capital that we don't value properly, and therefore they are poor. And so I, I, I welcome what you were just saying now about the, the valuation of carbon, because that would change a lot of things if we, if we index GDP and, and change how we measure. So Victor, I just wanted to, 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 to comment on that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adishna, and uh, excellent point indeed, particularly when we're looking at uh, the price of carbon well in excess of $300. I think that's a step in the, in the right direction. Um, looking forward to a time when that indeed becomes a reality. Um, Dr. Adishna, Africa requires and is going to require a tremendous amount of financial resources, much more than the public sector can ever put together. In effect, this cannot be done without the private sector. So what role do you see for the private sector in Africa uh, in order for these finances to best be tapped? Well, thanks very much. The, the, I guess I will couch my comments within the general issue of what needs to be done in the general economy first, because the private sector don't operate alone. And if the general economic environment doesn't provide the right incentives, that's not going to happen. So I do think that countries need to really ensure that um, natural resource, you know, uh, uh, capital accounting becomes a very, very important of how we measure wealth, which is what I said uh, in, the, in the beginning. And that both central banks and the fiscal authorities actually give the right incentives for uh, more uh, green growth, low carbon, development trajectories within within countries, because when you do that, then you set the right signals to the private sector to invest in the right technologies and to also take the right mitigation actions that they should, they, they should be taking. So I'll start from that particular uh, aspect. And I think this is why, for example, for us at the African Development Bank, we continue to work to support countries to update their independent national determined contributions, because that's the framework, the long-term strategies of countries. It's important. However, when I look at it today, we only have two countries in, in Africa that have a long-term uh, strategy on how you're going to do all this, all of these things that we're talking about. Um, that is Benin and South Africa. And so a big thing of is to make sure that we have the resources, and we're talking to several of our partner countries, to be able to um, support countries, all African countries, to come up with their long-term strategies that will include how they are going to create incentives for low carbon growth going forward and the adjustment cost and how it pays for that, all those things that are needed. That's the first thing. Second is, as we now look at the private sector, the thing I think it, that we need to do is to make sure that the, uh, the, the private sector, we, 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 we get resources from the institutional investors investing in the right technology, whether it's energy, whether it is um, climate resilient infrastructure, um, you know, whether it is sustainable forest management and agriculture and all of those things, a lot of resources to make this adjustment and this investment actually are there in the institutional investors. You take America, for example, you've got about probably $1.8 trillion of sovereign wealth funds, and pension funds, and maybe another $1.2, $1.3 trillion that are in sovereign wealth funds and others. So when you look at how much energy we need to invest in, for example, you need at least $100 billion a year in energy. But those monies could be there if we tap the institutional uh, investors where those monies are actually being invested outside of Africa in money market instruments that earn negative real rate of return, but they should be invested in Africa. So I would say that's important, but that will not happen unless we have project preparation facilities that actually allows that to happen and have uh, financial instruments that mitigate the risk of early project development by this, uh, in this infrastructure space to allow the uh, institutional investors to come in later. They need to invest when the income streams are stable. And so that's a role that we play 
as African Development Bank, Africa 50, which I chair their board, uh, private equity fund on, on, on infrastructure in Africa. That's uh, also one thing that uh, we must do. And, you know, just to close on this, we, I look at the, uh, the way in which we are trying to tackle this within the bank is we created something Professor Dufu has called the uh, African Financial Alliance for Climate. So essentially, it brings together the central banks, it brings together the public development banks, uh, the financial institutions, the commercial banks, uh, sovereign wealth funds and pension funds, in a way to green the financial ecosystem in Africa. To Because an example I can give you is that if you, if you look at stock exchanges, for example, if you start actually weighting the valuations of companies based on the positive contributions that those companies are making to low in a green, uh, um, uh, green development pathways, low carbon development things. Their valuation on the market that takes into consideration environment will actually improve. So there's a lot of consciousness of trying to do that. So this is what we are doing with that uh, African Financial Alliance uh, for, uh, uh, for climate to make sure that we create a more systemic approach of directing finance in the private sector towards low carbon uh, green growth trajectory. Uh, going forward. And finally, um, the African Development Bank, we are working very actively right now with Africa 50, uh, with uh, several other partners, European Investment Bank, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development on what we call the Alliance for Green Infrastructure, and also with Agence for Transitive Development, and also the, the CDC in the, in the UK, and others, you know, and also the, the, the US um, DFIC, to actually say we want to make sure that the unbuilt infrastructure in Africa, because a lot of the infrastructure is not yet built, but that in building, we want to actually emphasize green infrastructure. Then determining a framework, what is green infrastructure, green quality infrastructure, how do you rate it, how do you um, uh, 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 get facilities to develop the green projects, um, and how do you finance it? For example, the, the whole issue of um, uh, 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 nitrogen, uh, hydrogen, which is very, very important, uh, is one thing that uh, we think it's, uh, uh, is happening. So, Victor, I think there's a lot of opportunities, but private sector will tell you risk is important. Bankable projects are very, very important. And how do we make sure that a policy environment supports their moving into that area? These things cannot just be shifted to the private sector, as I said earlier. We have to create the enabling environment for the private sector to invest in low carbon pathways in Africa. Thank you very much, Dr. Adeshi. And I'm going to come to Professor Duflo with my last question, um, following which I would like for you to take about two minutes to provide uh, closing comments in this particular section here. Dr. Adeshi, you talked about risk. So, um, Professor Duflo, uh, the urgency of the crisis, and you, you also talked about uh, technological innovations earlier, but the urgency of the crisis that we're dealing with regards to climate change can actually speed up investment in policy and technological in innovations that have not yet been evaluated. So talking about risks, are there any risks associated with the swift deployment of potential technological solutions to your mind? Any, uh, any novelty comes with a set of risks uh, and things that we don't uh, necessarily uh, uh, anticipate. I, I think the biggest risk is often that things are much less effective than we think. So I, I, I tend to, you know, from my experience evaluating things, I haven't, you know, it, sometimes it finds that you, you know, you, you're looking at something and it has side effects that are negative uh, and that outweigh benefit. But more often what you find is you don't find just any benefit and the risk is waste of time, waste of money, etc. And that's, so that's the biggest risk we face. And uh, 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 we have a solution against this risk is we have to try things out, experiment, you know, quickly, you know, search both for positive and negative effects and quickly pivot, fail fast, like they're doing in, uh, in, in, uh, in the venture world, uh, have that same, you know, startup approach to a uh, startup spirit. Uh, to the development both of uh, new technologies that find 
develop, but also new technologies, new innovations uh, in the policy sphere. Thank you very much, Professor Duflo. Um, Dr. Adeshina, uh, I'd like for you to provide us with your closing comments in this conversation and exchange that we've had today, and then we'll come back to Professor Duflo for your closing comments. Well, first, you know, my, my closing comment is I'm just delighted that Professor Duflo is here. Um, you know, she is, she's brought up critical issues that we must uh, reflect reflect on, and I really very, very value the insights that you provided. And I look forward to our team and your team working together on some of the issues that we've discussed uh, on, this, uh, on, this, on this platform. Um, I think it just, there is need for good economics, sensible economics, and that we must not think that people are numbers. People are not numbers. They are real life issues that are here. Um, and so therefore there must be a whole sense of urgency, of accountability, of responsiveness uh, to dealing with the issues of climate, which affect farmers, which affect pastoralists, which affect Africa disproportionately, for which Africa didn't cause, by the way, you know, which is the same thing also with COVID, but we're suffering a lot now because of that. I, I think, you know, what I want to say is that um, it's very, very important for the world to work together and, 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 and make sure that there's no crisis of trust again on the climate as we have seen that crisis of trust on the COVID uh, vaccine situation. Um, because if you have a global social capital, we must not erode it by making sure there's no trust. And that's, for me, very, very important. For us on the issue of climate change, as African Development Bank, we, we, we believe that climate adaptation is the most important part, is the only option we have, really. And you know, we have committed to increase our climate finance to uh, $25 billion by 2025. And we have surpassed, by the way, um, you know, what Secretary General uh, uh, Guterres called for, 50-50% parity between climate mitigation and climate adaptation. We passed that in 2019, 2018 actually. Today, we have 63% on climate adaptation. And I'm excited about what we've done, we've done in terms of our launch uh, together of what we call the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, which we launched uh, together with the Global Center for Adaptation to take what is working to scale. And that's where I'm going to end. There are things that are working but we've got to go to scale. We have technologies for farmers in times of climate resilient technologies. We've already reached 11.2 million farmers with our technologies for African agricultural transformation, which connects the global R&D system to the national and regional R&D system, private sector and delivery system at scale, never seen before on this continent. Our goal is to take that to scale of 40 million farmers. And Professor Duflo, we're working on something that's called one for 200. Essentially, it is to raise a billion dollars that will allow us to take these uh, technologies to reach 40 million farmers. If those 40 million farmers are double, able to double their yields, they will pro produce about 100 million metric tons of food. And that will allow us to feed 200 million people. And today, the number of people that go to bed you know, hungry in Africa is 283 million people. So it means we can reduce that by 80%. So scale matters, speed matters, and accountability matters. And I think these are the things that um, I, I have seen from the conversation today. And I just want to say, Professor, thank you. You've inspired me even further to make sure those things are, 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 are done. Thank you very much, Dr. Adeshina. Over to you. Professor Duffler. Uh, I just wanted to thank you uh, and, uh, for this uh, invitation, for this uh, wonderful uh, conversation and for the work that you are doing on behalf of the entire continent uh, and to uh, uh, really add my good wishes for for continuing this work in an effective way and not just add my good wishes but add my uh, my, my offer and my my, my prayers that that we can uh, uh, the the poverty the Jamil Poverty Action Lab uh, which I help funded and the feed which um, which I'm sharing uh, work with you uh, hand in hand in 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 some of these projects I think the 
we are facing, uh, and in particular the African continent is facing an urgent crisis. The, the very urgent one is, of course, the COVID-19 crisis, which is not with us, but which is still with us, which is not gone. But the next urgent one is already upon us as well, and that's the, 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 climate, the climate crisis. And for that, there need to be a considerable effort of adaptation, finding these new seeds. The resistance is a great example. Uh, finding ways, sustainable way to provide more air conditioning is another one that we evoked. Um, and that cannot be done without a, a considerable uh, a work from, from governments, uh, from companies, and from every single individual. And this, uh, you know, working together of companies, civil society, and government is uh, to change behavior and frameworks is very much what our uh, climate action initiative at JPAL, which we call the King Climate Action Initiative or KKI, is, is set out to do. And we want to work on experimenting, finding new new uh, solutions, new innovative solutions, both to technological and uh, and policy problems, and uh, uh, helping and making sure that they are skilled up. So we uh, uh, hope to have a chance to to do this together in the future, and, and regardless, uh, I, I wish you uh, uh, success in the journeys that you have, that we are traveling together. And you, you were right to say that that Africa is, you know, holds the balance of our own climate in its hands and is not usually recognized uh, or compensated for it. And uh, this was a very helpful and important reminder. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Uh, before Professor goes. Uh, Professor, this will be sent to you at MIT. Wonderful, and thank you. Let me read it. It is not the same as the Nobel Prize in Economics, <laughs> but it, it comes with a lot of appreciation for you personally, for what you do. And it says the African Development uh, uh, Institute, appreciation and recognition for an outstanding lecture delivered on 13 December, 2021. Good economics for warmer times, how to address our climate change challenges. Presented to Esther Duflo, Professor of Economics at MIT, Cambridge University, United States of America, 2019 Nobel Laureate in Economics. And um, we appreciate it, we'll make sure it gets to you. So please help us put our hands together and thank Professor for a fantastic uh, 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 presentation today. Thank you very much, Professor Duflo. Over to you, Victor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Deshina. What an exciting and really inspiring time we've had today at the 2021 Kofi Annan Eminent Speaker Series. Thanks to our eminent speaker, Nobel Laureate, Professor Esther Duflo, and Dr. Akiwumi Adeshina, President of the African Development Bank, for expanding the discourse on the nexus between climate change, development, research, policy formation, finance, and innovation. Thoughts on what the developing world and indeed Africa must do at scale and at a more compact subsystemic level to mitigate and adapt to the devastating impacts of climate change, as well as what we must do to overcome poverty, to accelerate opportunities for wealth creation, to increase development, and more importantly, how the worlds of research, policy, finance, and development can create an alternative and preferable future. As the saying goes, leadership is the ability to see the future long before it arrives. I thank Dr. Adishina and Professor Doflo for doing your part in helping bring a preferable future into the present through your excellent contributions. To our global audience today, thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to seeing you in 2022 during the next Kofi Annan Eminent Speaker Series. I'm Victor Oladokun. Till then, goodbye and God bless. Thank you once again.